Hello, dear guests of the High Level Conference on Data Economy. Welcome back from the lunch break and welcome to the track two new revenue streams from data and platform economy. I hope you had a good break and you are now, you feel well and energetic because we have a very interesting track and uh, a lot to discuss and learn about growth. Uh, the growth potential of various content industries and how to generate growth in an efficient yet smart and sustainable way within the creative sector. Our focus now will be on the future, but we will also get acquainted with various content industries such as games and music through examples presented by our lovely speakers here. And by doing so, uh, we, will, uh, get, uh, we will acknowledge the lessons learned from different sectors that may benefit the overall infrastructure for the European content markets. We will have three main topics to discuss about. And as an introduction to all of these topics, we will enjoy short interviews and presentations. And our track will end in a panel discussion joined by all of our speakers and hopefully all of you in the, in the audience as well. So I welcome you to participate in the discussion by using the hashtags you see here, new revenue and copyright infra. And our moderators will make sure that your questions and comments are visible here. And I and the speakers will do our best to uh, include them in the discussion. As for my part, my name is Sila Löfström. I am the head of legal for the Creative Content Unit at YLE, which is the Finnish public broadcaster. And I've worked very closely with all the, uh, all the industries we're discussing about today. So I hope I'll be able to guide you through all these various topics in the next one hour and 30 minutes, which will be a bit of a challenge. So let's start. The gaming industry is a success story in the content market. Marco Ignatius has worked as a general counsel for Supercell, a very successful Finnish mobile game developer since 2013. Prior to Supercell, he has held various legal and executive positions in a number of companies in the field of mobile and online entertainment. Please welcome on the stage for our first interview on the topic of platforms and new business opportunities in the digital environment, Marco Ignatius. <laughs> Great to have you here, Marco. Thank you, Sala. Uh, we will be focusing now on the reasons behind the success of the mobile game industry and perhaps on the differences compared to other content industries in relation to data economy and platforms. So, but let's first start with you and Supercell. How did it all start? How did the success start? And how did you end up in the gaming industry? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, Supercell founders came together around uh, 10 years back. And uh, actually when they started talking, talking to each other, they weren't talking that much about what type of games they would create, yeah. but what type of a company they would create. Okay. And uh, these, all these guys were, they were industry veterans from different games companies. And uh, what felt a bit off to all of them was that uh, in games industry, it's typically you have this sort of creative visionary, creative director or a creative panel who vets all the proposals coming in from the developers. Yeah. And uh, it can be quite often that these guys who make the calls on what type of games will be created in what genre and so forth are not developers themselves. So mm. what if you would turn that sort of hierarchical pyramid upside down yeah. and empower the developers? It, it would be more of a, what you would call a creating a professional sports team. So you pick the right players, the best players, exactly. you empower them and you step away and let them do that magic. So okay. it sort of sounds simple, but that was the idea behind Supercell. Yeah, it sounds very efficient. Is yeah. that the secret for the rapid growth of the industry or just <coughs> Supercell? Well, we used to have this internal slogan capturing what I just told you. Best people make the best games. Yeah. A couple of years back, we actually realized that that's not true. 
it's the best teams that make the best, best games. So you might have the best players, but if they don't fit together as a team, then the magic doesn't happen. Exactly. And how did you get involved? So as to myself, I actually started in the big Nordic telco in the late 90s. And uh, luckily for me, after a couple of years, this telco founded this spin-off for early phase mobile entertainment and games for uh, international audience operator independent. And uh, I was always intrigued by the idea that Finland has been successful in many exports, but not actually providing services to customers yeah. or, or uh, consumers, if you yeah. will. And uh, I joined this outfit and I never looked back since. So I've been with Supercell for the past six and a half years, but before that, basically in online entertainment and mobile yeah. entertainment. How have you seen that the operational environment in the game industry has changed, let's say, during the past decade or so? Even Supercell's first game was a browser game, right? And then after It was, yeah. Uh, but and now mobile games. Yes. So we, I think the biggest, biggest, uh, new thing or th the game changer in the gaming industry has been the emergence of these uh, app stores. Yeah. So mobile gaming. And uh, Finland has traditionally been really good at uh, mobile development. Maybe there is the Nokia legacy and we have had really vibrant demo scene uh, hobbyists already mm -hmm. from the, since the 90s. So, so the, the emergence of app stores was really a big game changer is in the games industry. And uh, I think it's nowadays it's pretty much half and half mobile games versus console PC. And uh, we were pretty lucky with Supercell that we were there at the right time with our exactly. first mobile ta tablet games in 2012 when uh, tablets and uh, smartphones really became big mainstream thing. Yeah. Let's see, for example, here on the right, you can see the global entertainment industry. Yeah, <laughs> or there. Uh, you can see that the very traditional content industries and then video games. Yeah. It's quite remarkable. Yeah, I agree. Uh, what do you think are the similarities and then differences between gaming industry to the other content industries and uh, when it comes to the operational environment and the growth potential? And uh, just the, do you think that the mindset is also a bit different? Yeah, Are you know. maybe more fearless or do you take the full potential of the digital market? I don't know. I mean, I, I think ultimately all of these industries, we basically compete of people's time. Yeah. So it's, it's basically the same audience and how they consume entertainment. So that is definitely a similarity. What might be a difference is that video games are highly uh, interactive. Whereas films, not necessarily so. Music may be somewhere in the between if you are a musician yeah. or a performing artist yeah, exactly. <laughs> or like to dance. It seems that also this is very human centric in the end. Yeah, well, all these are creative industries. Yeah. So talent and creative contents and creativity is in the center of everything. Yeah. You also mentioned to me that uh, getting the best talent is very important. Yes. Yes, so basically, I mean, games industry, especially mobile game, games industry, it's not, uh, it's not driven by big investments to hardware or productions or, I mean, you don't need this Hollywood block blockbuster or you don't need uh, like the old PC console game 200 people development teams and, and multi-year development cycles. So, so you don't need that. But what you need is the talent. You need mm. the best talent. And, and definitely, uh, if you want to compete with the best in the market globally, you need to have access to that talent. And actually, that's something we've been struggling, for example, here in Finland, that how to entertain the best people from all over the world to come here. We have managed to do that, but there are a lot of stuff what the governments could do and probably the EU could do with, with being able to, uh, to to bring those talent, kind of whether it's taxation, immigration processes and so forth to yeah. the country.
Here also you can see the uh, growth of the global games market. Yeah. It's a very steady growth yes. and it continues. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems like you're on the right field. Yeah, I think it, this is just the beginning, actually. What do you think are the prospects and the proposals for next steps maybe to influence the growth, growth opportunities for the game industry or maybe just ensure that the growth will continue? Mm. I think uh, games are getting even more social. Uh, for example, uh, I guess many of the, I don't know whether you're gamers, but but you have heard of, for example, Fortnite, and, and many people who don't play Fortnite, they think it's a shooter game. Mm -hmm. But if you actually f look what's happening in that game, it's like what you would describe as a mall, where people go in, have fun, goof around, yeah. and, and do all so sorts of stuff with their friends. Yeah. So I think that, that will increase. I think uh, technology uh, will bring uh, platform conversions. I think streaming and gaming is going to be big in the future. Uh, more probably user-generated content. It's really engaging for the players to get involved with content creation. Mm -hmm. And it's, of course, for the industry, it's, it's uh, also helpful to get more content more easily yeah. and with less cost. So. Well, interacting with the gamers and the other industries is exactly what I want to discuss with <laughs> you more. But let's do it during the panel. Okay. So I thank you, Marco Ignatius. Thank you. Now we'll move on to our second topic, automatization of revenue streams in the creative sector. Helene Lindvall will be our next interview and is an award-winning professional songwriter and musician and board director at the Ivers Academy, formerly known as the British Academy of Songwriters, Composers and Authors, as well as the writer behind Guardian Music Industry columns, Behind the Music and Plugged In. She chairs the Ivers Academy Songwriter Committee as well as the Ivor Novella Awards Committee and is the former head of business and songwriter relations for song data management platform Audley, now known as Session. Uh, please welcome to the stage Helene Lindvall. Hi Helene, I'm thrilled to have you here. And I'd very much like to discuss y with you about the music industry and the challenges in the platform and data economy from a songwriter's perspective. And uh, maybe also focus on your vast experience in the development of apps and techniques to assist songwriters to manage their data on works and copyright. But first, from your point of view, point of view as a songwriter, uh, why is this subject so crucial from the songwriter's perspective, and what are the current challenges related to crediting and accurate uh, revenue streams? Um, well, well it's, uh, how, how split up the dissemination of data is in yeah. the music industry. First of all, um, as some people might know, there's more and more writers per song, mm -hmm. um, in, in particular in the top 100. So these days, I mean, every year it seems to increase. Uh, last year, uh, the top 10 in America uh, had an average of 9.1 writers. Average? To, yeah, wow. to a song. Granted, that's also because of sound. It's not like nine people were sitting in the studio, mm -hmm. but it's sampling and, and uh, other uh, ways of kind of uh, disseminating old music. Yeah. Um, but that then... Uh, presents really dif uh, strong difficulties when it comes to uh, getting the correct data and getting the correct data on time. Um, to, just to kind of um, comment on, on uh, how music works, uh, looking at the previous um, presentation and looking at uh, the growth of, of revenue, you see gaming, movies, and, and uh, music. But the interesting thing is, of course, music is part of all both yes. of those other uh, industries, and, and yet it wasn't growing, funnily enough. Um, and uh, th this is to, to be able to uh, collect royalties from from all the different uh, avenues is very, very difficult, and it's yeah. proven that that the, the industry has kind of operated in an analog world, um, even though uh, we 
it has transferred to a digital world. Yeah, exactly. You touched this subject a bit already, but how do you see that the operational environment in the music industry has changed? Again, let's say the past decade. Well, it's a lot faster. <laughs> um, and uh, the release of records happens a lot quicker. Yeah. Um, and uh, with that, we've also lost uh, the tradition of uh, showing credits. Yeah. Um, so uh, as composers and songwriters, we feel like we've completely disappeared. Um, not just uh, revenue-wise, but also credit-wise. Okay, interesting. Well, uh, the mu music industry showed growth for the first time in a more than a decade in 2016. How could the music industry achieve this uh, uh, g uh, growth that would directly benefit or more directly benefit the songwriters as well, as you now said? Well, I think that there, first of all, I think that some a lot of people might be surprised that, that uh, DSPs don't have any information on who the composers and songwriters are. So yeah. the way that we are paid is a very arduous way of, of uh, distributing royalties every month when when um, the PROs, the performing rights organizations and publishers get a data dump from each DSP yeah. that says how many songs have been streamed how many times or and which those which songs those are and then they're asked to send in an invoice mm -hmm. for whatever is theirs. Um, as you can imagine, that uh, first of all, it never adds up to 100%. It usually adds up to more than 100% for the DSP to pay back. And this is due to multiple Im invoicing from, from different uh, PROs and publishers yeah. where they might not be um, aware that there's a sub-publisher. It's, it's just a, a, a very convoluted way of getting paid. Yeah. Um, and for us, as songwriters, we actually think that, that uh, it's 2019 and we, we should be able to actually uh, create some sort of database that can, can be used and that, that the DSPs will have uh, the information. Also, that a record label should not be able to release a record without having all the required information. Yeah. In the sense of, I, I would make the, uh, the comparison of uh, a supermarket, you know, if you walk down to Lidl or Aldi or whatever the, the supermarket is in your uh, neighborhood and buy an, an egg sandwich, there's no way that, that they wouldn't know where the egg, where the mayonnaise, where the bread, where the butter came from yeah. so they can pay and pay the, uh, the correct supplier. But yeah. somehow when it comes to music, it's different. It's, uh, you know, they've just kind of washed our hands of that. You see here on the right a uh, example, or again here, <laughs> example yeah. of metadata. This is from Apple Music, and uh, I just looked at this exact same record uh, in Spotify, which also have no has now credits, and the credits were different. Yeah. Which means that the, <laughs> <laughs> the problem is the lack of data sometimes, and maybe also inaccurate data. Yes, well, it doesn't come from uh, the songwriters in, in a lot of ways. It comes from uh, sometimes user-generated sources. And uh, anybody who's looked up, uh, well, certainly I, I, know, I know songwriters and producers that have looked up their works on Wikipedia yeah. and, and see that somebody else has been credited with their work. Um, so we need to have a, a, a verified source. And... Um, to me, I think that the, the most Im important thing is that it actually comes straight from the songwriter yeah. and, and then gets funneled through to the, uh, okay. the end. Does the accurate data now rely on the songwriter alone, or who is the one who corrects that f false uh, data? What, what the false data? It, uh, well, uh, I'm, I have no idea where that data comes okay. from, to be perfectly <laughs> okay. honest. I, I think sometimes... It's the record label, but I, I think yeah. to, to kind of use a, a really practical example, mm. uh, there was a couple of years ago, there, there was a, a, a young producer, 22 years old, that, that um, realized that, or, or found out that Justin Bieber and, and Chris Brown were both going to release records. So when those records uh, were about to get released, he added himself as producer on the Wikipedia page of these records. Okay. Uh, and it turned out that uh, Beavers and Chris Brown's uh, record label PR people 
did not go to the source and get the information when they were going to send out their press releases. Instead, they went on Wikipedia, which meant that they then sent out a press release that According said that this guy had, had produced those records. Impressive. And, uh, and, and uh, obviously, I mean, I have to take my hat off for his uh, creativity with that, but the real producers obviously were um, pretty miffed about it. Yeah. Um, and, and clearly, there, there needs to be a verified source with yeah. that. So I, I have no idea where that, those... Yeah. Um, they were just a good going. reminder on the uh, on the screen that that it's it's a very there's so many entities involved and it's a very global problem. Yeah, and there's a, a exactly and then the 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 previous um, slide there that that was saying that 20% uh, of royalties uh, are unattributable. Uh, or actually, it just said that that we're losing 20% um, of royalties. Actually, the the uh, reality of it is that it's probably more like 30 or 40% of, okay, of all wow. royalties that are collected that are unattributable, yeah. which means that in the end, they get uh, distributed according to uh, market share, um, which is a not accurate, we are arguing, because uh, in reality, the, the independent uh, labels and, and publishers are more likely to not have correct or, or missing data than the major labels and the major publishers who, in the end, when you distribute according to market share, are going to take 80 to 85 percent of yeah. all the royalties. Do you see that the, <laughs> I know your answer, but the potential <laughs> of music, is it used to the fullest already or what could we do to make the situation better? Um, well, I think that they're, they're um, uh, as, as, as a, a Swedish person, I'm not as afraid of regulation as, as um, some of my uh, countrymen now in the United Kingdom. Uh, I think that there's a, there needs to, to be, be some sort of regulation on music usage. Yeah. Uh, that uh, they, they need to actually have the information of, of who the songwriters are. I think we need to make it more uh, easier to uh, collect yeah. That data. We need to educate uh, music creators um, in the and make it easy for them to input that data and for that data to get disseminated for PROs, uh, the performing rights organizations, to collaborate a lot more. Yeah. Um, I know that the EU has tried to, um, in in with their uh, their most kind of. Uh, helpful um, thought of making it easier for songwriters to join whichever p uh, performing rights organizations yeah. they want, but actually what this created was even more complications okay. for, uh, for data. So as an example, I'm uh, Swedish, I belong both to STIM and, and to PRS, the, the two local uh, performing rights organizations. Yeah. Um, and my uh, publisher, or one of my publishers, is Universal. And Universal decided for all their Anglo-American uh, repertoire that they would uh, take all the, their repertoire out of PRS and put it in SACEM, which is mm. the French local yeah. PRO. This now means that my songs are, are, uh, should be collected in a very roundabout way both by STIM, by PRS, and, and by SASM. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, I have no idea when I get my royalty statements, if they're correct or what they are referring to, yeah. and if I have a, an issue, which of these three PROs I should contact. Yeah. And the registrations don't even match. So the same song will have different percentages and publishers in different PR, uh in different uh, PROs and, and, and uh, countries. So that needs to be um, synchronized somehow because yeah. there's no way that, that I, I get paid correctly in that sense. People always say that music industry is very complex and <laughs> it sounds like it's not gonna get any easier any time soon. Well, I think that the, the back office should be, I mean, we should, it's, it's an advantage that we can negotiate yeah. and, and have uh, commercial negotiations, um, but the back office needs to be more streamlined because yeah. really having, having uh, all these data silos competing 
is, is not beneficial for music creators themselves. Yeah, exactly. I would love to get more into detail to the subject later on the panel, but now I will thank you. Helene Lindvall. Thank you. Now we're going to continue on our topic and uh, I'm going to make a question to what extent is automated licensing of digital content offered today and what does upscaling of any models require? To continue on this subject is Bill Rosenblatt, who is the uh, president of Giant Steps Media Technology Strategies, a consulting firm that he founded in 2000. Giant Steps clients include content providers and digital media, med media technology companies ranging from very early on startups to multinationals, as well as law and policy entities and investment firms worldwide. Bill has advised public policy entities in the United States, Europe and South Korea and has served as an expert witness in several litigations related to copyright and digital media technology. Uh, at NYU, he teaches data analysis in the music industry, and he's the program chair of annual copyright technology conference in New York. Bill has degrees in computer science, and you are very welcome to present us uh, the next presentation. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. <laughs> so I'd like to... <laughs> now. Yeah. I feel like I'm on a quiz show here. <laughs> um, I'd like to, uh, it's an honor to be here um, back in, in the, the world leaders among uh, data policy governance. Uh, this, is, this is where it, it happens, and so I'm thrilled to be part of this, uh, this event. And so we're talking about automated licensing of digital content, and I think a lot of these points on this slide are, are points that have been raised. Cop content is now copied and distributed at internet speed and scale. And the ways in which we all consume content as well as create content are changing and evolving very rapidly. The licensing has to take place at the same speed and scale. And otherwise, the um, consumers will gra gravitate towards the unpaid models because it's always easier when you don't have to do anything versus when you have to do something in order to claim your rights and get paid. So what do we need? Well, we need, uh, this is a term that one of the conference uh, organizers introduced to me, copyright infrastructure. I heard this term and I thought I have to steal that because now someone has finally described what I've been doing for the past 20 years. So thank you. Copyright infrastructure is what we're here to talk about. And here are the elements of it that I'm going to get into. And uh, I'm going to take my watch off to make sure that I stay on, on schedule here. Complete, precise, accurate, and current data. All, all four of those. Complete, precise, accurate, and current data. Identification of content. Identification of rights holders. Metadata, which means a lot of different things depending on context. Protocols for conveying that information. And then repositories and registries for storing it and, and maintaining it over time. Those are the things that are, that are necessary. They are the components of copyright infrastructure. So these come from various places. They come from laws or they arise out of laws, cop mainly copyright law. They come out of industry conventions. How have we been doing things for years or decades? They come out of standards that are developed. They come out of entrepreneurial activities, uh, companies and, and individuals who create new ways of doing things. They come out of experimentation, and they come out of agreement over best practices, whether those are standard formally or, or otherwise. So I'm going to give you an example here of how this works in the music industry. And music industry gets a lot of attention. And I'm going to, ex as I'm going to explain, there are two sides to, to that. One is music industry does a lot of things that could be done better. But on the other hand, the music industry is a much more easily understood area of the media industry than other areas where it's even harder. And so. It's just sort of easier to talk about the music industry. So I, I taught this example in, in a class at NYU, and it took me quite a long time to find an example that's this simple. 
because most of the examples, as Halian pointed out, are, are a lot more complicated. So here we have a song by Lady, that performed by Lady Gaga called Bad Romance, recent hit from a few years ago. And let's say someone plays it on Spotify. You've got essentially three royalty streams that come out of that, and they end up with, uh, at, uh, ideally, at two individuals who happen to be both the performers and the composers, Lady Gaga and Red One, who is the producer slash co-writer of this tune. They go through three publishing companies, which are the, I have a laser pointer here, whoops. Uh, laser pointer here, the, these are the three publishers, House of Gaga, Songs of Red One, which is Red One's publisher, and then Sony ATV, which acts as essentially the back office for those publishers. And then you have, and this is a US example, and I apologize for that, but that's, the US is the environment that I understand the best. You've got these organizations uh, that exist to manage those royalties. HFA is the Harry Fox Agency, which manages mechanical royalties on musical compositions, which are the rights to reproduce a composition, which you can think of as a sh sheet music, essentially, as opposed to the recorded performance of that composition, which is handled by a record label, in this case, Interscope, owned by Universal. And then you have the performance of the composition as opposed to the reproduction of the composition, which is done through a performance rights organization called BMI. So th this is, again, a simple example. And it involves all kinds of data that I'm not going to go over in detail. But there are all sorts of identifiers for entities and people and the composition, which is the ISWC number on the left, and the sound recording, which is the ISRC number on the right. There will not be a quiz uh, later, <laughs> so don't worry about the details. And then here again are the, are the entities involved in this transaction. And then there are some protocols that, that are used to convey this data back and forth. A couple of them come from a standards body called DDEX, which is a music industry standards body. And then there's one called CWR, which has to do with the conveyance of publishing information to performing rights organizations. So in terms of registries and databases, the big complaint, which Helian also uh, mentioned, is that there is no complete, current, and accurate database of all this information. In the United States, we just passed legislation last year that uh, is intended to establish a complete, accurate, and current database for one slice of this information, which is the uh, mechanical rights on compositions. And we'll see how that goes. That is supposed to be implemented uh, in January of 2021. So we go back to the notion of where do these things come from? They come from copyright law. There are industry conventions that come into play, such as the convention that it's Spotify's responsibility to go find who the composers are and to pay those royalties. The information is not supplied to Spotify in the first place. It has a job of going and finding that information. Similarly, in the book publishing industry, there is a convention currently being contested in a litigation in the United States that audiobook retailers must license text separately if they're going to use the text as opposed to audio of the text. There are standards. There's standards for identifiers, standards for metadata, standards for protocols. There are entrepreneurial activities that bring us to where we are today, Spotify being one very prominent example. There are entrepreneurial activities in the area of how do we identify content automatically? Who's used Shazam? So Shazam is an example of that. There are also metadata capture technologies that establish the metadata in a way that it can be used down the line. And the company now known as Session that Halian used to work for is an example of that. Uh, there's plenty of experimentation and best practices as well. So there are some lessons here. And broadly, the lessons, uh, among many others, are, first of all, the technical standards around distribution are now in the hands of distributors and not anyone upstream, such as content owners. This is a lesson that is, the content owners are, are uh, learning or have learned. Standards have to develop together with the market. You need to have incentives to create repositories and registries. They don't just happen out of thin air. 
and change is, is, is forced to happen by the scale that we now deal with uh, in, the, on the, in the internet age. So I'm not going to go over this in a lot of detail, but this is just a chart that says the red items are the ones that are proprietary and, and controlled by private companies. So for example, ebook formats are mostly proprietary and controlled by three entities that predominate worldwide, Amazon, Apple, and Kobo. Um, on the DRM side, those are mostly proprietary with one small exception, which is the Redium LCP DRM for eBooks, which I helped develop, which is mostly operative in Francophone Europe and Francophone Canada. Standards in the market must develop together. Here are some old practices around standards that I think need to, be, to go away on the left-hand side of this slide. Don't implement anything until all of the details have been agreed. Bad idea. Closed clubs, non-disclosure agreements that you have to sign in order to read a spec instead of the specs being open, bad idea. Uh, standards that are, arise um, as de facto standards from proprietary organizations instead of open standards, also not helpful to the market. Better ideas a minimum viable approach to standards where you, um, you test and you iterate, entrepreneurs invited to the table, specs being publicly available, and a faster open standards process instead of waiting years and years for anything to happen, by which time the market has moved on. I'm going to skip over these if anyone wants to. These slides will be available uh, online. This is my sauce test for the viability of standards. It <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, gladly talk about that offline, but um, incentives for registries. The data, once again, has to be accurate, complete, and up-to-date. The, re the repositories need to be accessible and reliable. There need to be equitable dispute resolution mechanisms. All of this costs money, and it requires appropriate governance. And the latter point is something that isn't often talked about. So I looked at the governance models of uh, rights information registries and repositories, and I found that there are a few different examples. For, uh, what, one is the private for-profit example, and MVB in, in Germany, which is the ISBN agency for Germany in the book industry, is an example of that. Private non-profit entities that manage these things, such as Tailstow here in Finland for music compositions, that's an example of that. The IDER consortium, which is an identifier and metadata repository for video content, uh, which is global, although uh, headquartered in the US, that is a consortium model uh, put together by the major TV st uh, movie studios and TV networks. Um, a registry by legal mandate is another example, and the Mechanical Licensing Collective in the U.S. that just got called into being by the uh, new legislation called the Music Modernization Act, that's an example of that, and we'll see how that goes. And then finally, the newest form of this is to have an ownerless uh, registry by using blockchain technology, and there are a few. Verisart is just an example from visual arts there, there are various other examples where you have blockchain technology which enables an ownerless uh, repository. Scale forces change. So if, uh, one example is composition mechanical licensing for interactive music streaming, which is what, uh, what Heli and I and I have, Helian and I have both been discussing. The streaming market in music is now trillions of streams per year. It requires track by track uh, matching to compositions and licensing, and a service like Spotify that ingests tens of thousands of music tracks into its library every day. That is a, a staggeringly difficult and, and large uh, problem to contend with. So music is the leading edge case because the universe of what you need to deal with is relatively tractable, meaning it's, it's, you, you can sort of put it in a box, so to speak. There are these simple atomic units known as songs or compositions or recordings or even albums. There's a small set of basic rights to these entities such as reproduction, distribution, and in Europe you have communication to the public. In the United States we have something called public performance. There's a fairly small set of conventional usage rules around these rights and there are standard identifiers that we've shown that are widely used. 
And then there are factors forcing technological change in the music industry, such as transaction volumes and the demand for precision and transparency in payments on those enormous transaction volumes. So in contradistinction to that, if we look at higher education and academic publishing uh, books and journals, it's a much more fuzzy, less tractable universe. You've got complex works with thousands of licensed or licensable parts. The average college textbook will have a few thousand different items in it that need to be dealt with. Um, there's a lot of variation in what needs to be licensed. Each product has got a lot of different variations. It's not just the same song released in different countries. It's a lot of different versions of that textbook or, or what have you being released all over the place in different formats. There are lots of different usage rules and domains, much more granular rights that have to be licensed, and uh, a much fuzzier and larger world of identifier standards than in the music industry. And then finally, you have in the academic world product development cycles that are measured in years instead of weeks or months, which means that people are even less attuned to the, to the notion that, that data must be very current and very fast moving. So that is just meant to say that even though there are problems in the music industry, other sectors of the media economy have even a tougher time uh, and, and require attention to these, to these issues. And I'm very happy to see this conference where attention is being paid to these issues uh, by influential people. And so once again, very happy to be here and to speak to everyone here. How did I do on time? <laughs> Can I have some voice? Thank you. We actually have some time, Bill. May you talk about the source test that you skipped now? Sure. I'm happy to talk about Good. that. It took me quite a while to create a nice sounding acronym for this test. <laughs> <laughs> you managed but, that. But there are, uh, in my experience, there are five factors that need to be met for a standard to have a good probability of success. And this is independent of the speed to market issue, which I talked about before. Scope, adoptability, urgency, complexity, and equity. So that spells sauce. Scope, it has to be focused and clear. You cannot be out to solve the problem of world hunger. Adoptability, it has to work fairly easily with existing systems, uh, devices, tools, and processes. It cannot require that you gut your systems and replace them wholesale with something new. Urgency, it has to solve a known current practical problem, not just a theoretical thing that it would be nice to solve you know, so that we can all get along and so on. Complexity, it has to be relatively simple. I've seen a lot of standards fail because they are just too complicated. Uh, they are over-engineered, or they are camels. Um, for those of you who know, that's the answer to the riddle, what's a horse designed by a committee? A camel. Uh, equity, it has to be a win-win-win for all involved. It cannot create a situation where one set of participants benefits to the detriment of another set of participants. So that is the sauce test. And I've listed a few standards that did not succeed and um, some reasons why they didn't succeed. The Global Repertory Database, for those of you who don't know, how many people have, uh, understand what that is, the GRD, as opposed to the GPRD? All right, so um, that was an attempt, sorry, GDRP, GDRP, right, yeah. So the GRD was an attempt to build a global database of music rights information, and it, it kind of collapsed around five years ago. Um, and, and I would say that there were a lot of issues with it, but one was that it was overambitious. It certainly was a worthy effort to solve a problem that really needed to be solved. The other was this notion that was fully acknowledged by the organizers from the very beginning. There was no financial model to pay for it. So, and that became problematic. Another, uh, I'll skip to the bottom because it was discussed this morning in, in relation to the My Data initiative. The Liberty Alliance was an attempt to create more or less the same thing as the My Data initiative is trying to do today, a standard for your personal information that you own, that you control, 
and it was uh, essentially a reaction in the market to a universal online identifier standard from Microsoft, uh, whose name I can't recall at the moment, but that freaked everyone out. Oh my gosh, Microsoft is going to own our, our world, so we need to organize and create a unified standard to go up against this Microsoft unified identifier system, and that is also something that collapsed under its own weight. Um, although ironically, nowadays, you've got a number of systems that did exactly what this Microsoft system that everyone was afraid of uh, uh, today, such as login with Facebook, login with Google, login with Twitter. So um, those are just two examples of, of uh, standards that failed the sauce test. Thank you very much. Give a big applause to Bill Rosenblatt. I think we can continue on these topics as well during the panel. All right. Thank and you. now I would like to uh, remind you of the hashtags, so feel free to join the conversation. One of the hashtags is Bill's favorite, uh, copyright infra, <laughs> and then there's another one, hashtag new revenue. But now we have the perfect opportunity to move on to our third and final topic of what should EU do next to develop the content market and hear Commission's view. Gail Kent is one of the most senior British officials in the European Commission in Luxembourg and she's the Director of Data for Communications, Networks, Content and Technology. Her current responsibilities include both policy and program management in the fields of data economy, promoting cultural heritage and removing digital barriers. We're so happy to have you here. Please welcome for your introductory remarks on this subject. So I think I should start by apologizing for not being my boss, who's Claire Berry, um, who unfortunately has a stomach upset. Um, so I've come to replace her. Um, but I'm so happy to be here, um, and partly because um, although I'm the director of data, that's my short title, I actually also have in my um, directorate uh, the digital for culture um, uh, file, and also uh, safer internet for kids. When we were talking in the in the room, the other room this morning, about one in three internet users being a child. This is something I'm always quoting when I've got that hat on as well. So I feel this kind of fits very nicely into what I'm doing. The other thing I think it's really good to be here at this moment is because we're at a very strange time in the EU history, as it were, because um, our, our commission has not yet been voted in, but probably will be voted in on Wednesday. We will probably by next Sunday or Monday, rather, have a new commission. So kind of I'm here standing really with an empty box. Um, waiting for you to fill it <laughs> with, uh, with ideas. Uh, not even really yet been a being aware of what my commissioner, apart from what he said in his uh, um, hearing in the U European Parliament, not really being aware of what his priorities are likely to be because I haven't had a dis chance to discuss it uh, with him yet. So I'd like to thank the Finnish presidency for making data policy um, a key element of the term because sharing and use of data, including and in the creative industries will also be at the core of the next commission's policies on the data economy. So in, in my commissioner so Thierry, um, Thierry Breton, in his hearing at the European Parliament, he said his priorities were data, data, and data. So I nearly fell off my chair when I heard that. Um, uh, so you can see how important it's going to be. Um, the Commission agrees that creative industries, like everyone today, should fully exploit all the pen potential benefits of data and that this is not always the case. The, the debate on how to ensure that creative industries make the most of technology to improve the management of metadata has been a priority for the Finnish Presidency. The Commission has welcomed this and contributed to the discussion of this initiative in the Council. Well, incidentally, the um, infrastructure, copyright infrastructure, also learnt it today, and I think it's a great way of uh, explaining things. The Commission also agrees that EU creative industries should advance in ensuring the use of standard and interoperable metadata to, to, to identify content. Potential licenses need to have access to authoritative sources of data on who owns the content they want to use. 
This is the key to develop trust and ensure efficient management of rights in the content market. And so we look forward to continuing our dialogue with all the relevant stakeholders on how the public sector could support the industry in achieving these goals. But the importance of data for creative industries is not limited to the metadata on the content. For example, we know that content streaming platforms, Spotify, Netflix, hold lots of valuable data on the use of copyright protected content. They use it to reduce new content and for advertising purposes. So as a rights owner, I might also want to have the information on the data around the use of my piece of uh, music or piece of film or whatever it was. There is a legitimate debate on whether other European market players should have access to that data. <coughs> the upcoming Commission will continue to examine all of these issues together with other EU institutions and relevant stakeholders. Uh, as you know, we have, a, we have a promise of some kind of regulation or recommendation on artificial intelligence, which is supposed to be done in the first three months of the new Commission. But again, we haven't really had a chance to decide exactly what would go in it. I don't think we're going to be heavy-handed on regulation, however. Um, we also have promised that there will be a Digital Services Act. This is very much an empty box at the moment um, because we don't know what will be in it. But we know that there is an issue to do with uh, the power and liability of digital platforms. And so that's something also which will be discussed uh, during this, these next few months. So I think really the most interesting discussions is with the cultural side. I want to listen to what you have all got to say so I can take that back to my political masters. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gail. Please be seated. Now we come to the most challenging part of our track, where we'll fill the box, as Gail said, <laughs> completely and resolve everything related to data economy. But now we'll have a panel discussion about what should EU do next to develop the content market. And uh, our speakers have the possibility to elaborate on the discussions that we've already have had. So don't, uh, don't worry if I, if I make a question that we've already discussed. It's about uh, now commenting and a chance for the, for the audience to comment as well. So. We have two parts in this uh, discussion, two different topics. The first one is how to ensure sustainable growth in the creative sectors in the EU. And I would like to go back to the first question I said to uh, Marco, which was that what are the reasons for the current growth numbers in the EU in the different sectors? And what would be the main challenges and opportunities for competition uh, with the other big economies? Is there someone who would like to start? <laughs> Um, so it's such a huge uh, question. I, um, I think, as, as I kind of touched on before, music, the, the you know, consumption of music mm. is, is bigger than ever, but it hasn't actually been, been uh, reflected in revenue for music creators, sadly. Exactly. And, and uh, a large part of that is, you know, a lack of, of uh, correct data. Yeah. And I think the collaboration, I mean, there's a lot of great things that, that uh, Brett touched on um, where uh, they, there's a lack of collaboration between um, the, the different stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And I believe that a lot of the time, uh, I always want to look at what is the uh, incentive to solve a problem and yeah. what is the funding to solve a problem. Yeah. Uh, and this is what we've been battling with, uh, as uh, when you mentioned the, G the Global Repertoire Database, both none of those uh, were really satisfied, mm. uh, in particular the funding part of it. Um, and if there is uh, certain uh, players that uh, are not incentivized to solve this problem, that benefit from a lack of correct data, yeah. Uh, which is what what tends to happen in in the music industry when you have the big players, the the, the major labels and 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 publishing companies that do benefit from uh, having being paid on a market share basis mm -hmm. instead of granular data. Yeah, um, I think that uh, the one of the examples 
would be when we're looking at on the master rights, which are the, is the recording mm -hmm. rights, um, where we looked at the independent sector in uh, conjunction with the uh, with SoundCloud. Yeah, I don't know if you remember SoundCloud. Uh, mm -hmm. A few years back, uh, was forced to go legit, or, or decided to go legit. And so they had to pay a big chunk of money to the music industry for all past usage um, that had been um, done on, on its platform. And in the UK, the, the record company uh, organization or the master rights organization that is also for the performers, um, they said, well, we should, the, the major label said we should divide it according to market share, which then would be 80 to 85% to the major labels and 20, 15 to 20% for the independents. Mm -hmm. And the independent sector uh, said, no, let's drill down into the data and see what's actually been used on SoundCloud. And um, of course, if you ever been on SoundCloud, it's not a lot of Taylor Swift that is being streamed. It's like, it's a lot uh, of electronic artists, yeah. it's hip hop artists, it's a lot of independents. And actually, it turned <coughs> out that it was completely the opposite ar way around, that yeah. the independent sector was responsible for 80 to 85% of, of the usage of, of consumption, and the majors only that 15%. And, and this is why we think it's so important to actually have that, uh, that, that, that there is an incentive for everyone around the table to get get the data right. This is a very good and practical example. As we're now in the topic of what should EU do next, uh, what this policies do you think are needed at EU level for the content industry to f flourish in a way that we, we would all like it to be? Is uh, Bill or uh, Gail? Well, well, I can give um, an example of what's taken place in the US, uh, yeah. which, which doesn't mean it's the right answer. It's just sort of, here's, here's a direction that I think uh, should be taken, which is just participation in industry initiatives by government. Uh, that, that's step one, right? So show up to the standards meetings, show up to the conferences where the people come and uh, talk about these things at a granular level. The, for example, the US Patent and Trademark Office, which sits within the Commerce Department in the US, we have a funny situation in the US where patents and trademarks are off to one side and copyrights are off to, off to another side and there's yeah. no single uh, intellectual property office as there is in the UK and, and here and elsewhere. So um, the, the PTO holds an annual event every roughly January where this is what they talk about. And the, the point of it is that government people are there and they are learning what the issues are on the ground for professionals. And you know, in Europe, I see that there's great potential for that to turn into um, regulatory policy being molded while stuff is happening instead of after it's too late. Mm. So that, that's what I would put out there. Yeah. Any comments on this? Uh, I, think <laughs> I think it's more a case. I mean, my comments. In, in terms of why there has been growth in the creative sectors, well, we like to think we like to think uh, that, that that's partly because of the um, the whole the, all the work that's been done on the digital single market and actually um, trying to reduce fragmentation in Europe so that Europe is an entire market instead of you know 27 or 28 individual mm. markets. So I think also there has been maybe a recognition, maybe because of political bigger political issues, there's been a recognition on, on the importance of um, the creative sector to the economy, not in terms of numbers, but also in terms of, you know, s values, in terms of values. And yeah. so perhaps it has been until now a little bit the Cinderella service of for, for policymakers, but it's becoming more more central. Yeah. Um, and then, in, in t I mean, when I listen to all of you talking about it, I can see everything is very com We don't tend to make individual uh, EU laws in, in particular areas. I mean, it would tend to be across areas, and it is incredibly complicated. And mm. so I think you have to go, you have to, you know, regulation is not always the answer to things because, you know, you can go in and, w and, and ruin things with your elephant steps, I think. You, you have to be, 
you have to be very careful that you right. take into consideration all of the different possibilities and yeah. and interests. But then maybe the uh, the funding part of that the mm. conundrum is is important ag again yeah. because if you're if you're looking across, uh, <coughs> you you want the the uh, Europe to to work together with that, and at the moment because the the PROs are are competing with each other, mm. uh, they are. Uh, there are many of them that are holding on to their data hmm. um, because they, they feel that having that data is the reason for existing, where <coughs> as, as a music creator, we, uh, I, I think a lot of music creators would be horrified knowing that, that their data is not shared between PROs so that they can get properly remunerated. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and actually that the PROs, that their function should be to, to support um, local uh, music creators instead in, in many other ways and so they're, they're, there's definitely a function for them yeah. and it should not be uh, as a, a data repository to be, be sold on or hold on, held on to. I, yeah. I think the borders. issue of governance is extremely important in yeah. general in, in data because it's not only in the music industry where people are frightened to you know, are nervous about sharing their data and everybody knows that it would be good to use some kind of data that's around in order to help society or help government mm. or wh whatever, um, but they're nervous about it. So I think some kind of data governance is going to be, is going to be an important part of what we do in the next uh, few years. And I hope it will apply equally to. Well, yeah. as I said, I don't, I, I, at least speaking personally, I don't think <laughs> anyone has thought enough about the right governance models for no. this type of data. I, th I think that that requires more attention than it's, than it's gotten. What is the right governance model? It's not necessarily uh, top-down regulation. Don't know what it is. That's mm. a great area to look We're into. The, the other point that I wanted to introduce is I worked on music licensing for a, a startup music service a few years ago, and the idea of having to do 20-some the number changed slightly over the past few years, 28, 27 different licenses to get a service launched in Europe was just a very high barrier to a, an entrepreneurial startup. It, it pretty much guaranteed that unless you were a huge company with, with a lot of resources on the ground in 27 or however many capitals, it wasn't going to get done, and your process was just forbiddingly complex. Yeah. And the digital signal mar a single market was a great attempt to, to solve that problem. And uh, obviously you also have then uh, what's happened sin since and with ICE and having, having you know, licensing bodies that can operate. Um, and uh, and I, I do understand that the, it might not be uh, ideal to have one that, that licenses for the entire continent of, of Europe but at least make it less than 27 or 28 um, <laughs> so, so that uh, it, it's just more efficient because also, I mean, as a music creator, you don't want all your royalties to go on admin yeah. fees and, and, uh, and, and the more different licensees you have, the more likely you are to, for, your, for your money to kind of disappear into like a, a black hole of... of um, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, un unattributable un data, so to speak. <laughs> there's also the, the idea that um, if, if there's a monopoly, there's no competition, and lack of competition leads to a lack of efficiency. Yeah. So. Now I have a question for you, Marco. As you've heard now a lot, a lot, a lot of discussion about music industry, is there something we could learn from g the gaming industry? And do you perhaps even see the two industries interacting with each other more in the future? as we've already seen a few examples. Yeah, <coughs> well, first of all, I feel like a black sheep listening to the all the granular <laughs> stuff <laughs> around the music industry. My own last experiences with mu music industry was in the early millennia when I tried to, to acquire rights for mobile ringtones and especially recordings, and I remember it yeah. was really complex at that time already. My personal thinking was that music industry was still holding on to their old practices rather than embracing digital at the time. Maybe that's same change, but uh, <coughs> probably hard for me to sort of start advising uh, other industries, but definitely in the entertainment sector, you see a lot of collaboration between mm. film, music, games, and I think that will 
increase. I mean, traditionally, because IPs are so important uh, for any entertainment, if there is a powerful existing IP or yeah. performer or or a track or whatnot, so that that's really powerful in terms of because it's really really hard to build up new IPs which yeah. hit mainstream. So I guess traditionally uh, games have acquired IP licenses from film industry, uh, comics like Marvel Universe and whatnot. Mm. But probably in the future it could be that the next Marvel Universe would come from the games industry and adopt it yeah. in mm. the, the, the other industries. So you say that there's a, a potential for sort of a virtual superstars in the way that in the traditional waves we've seen the music industry, for example, like in uh, yeah esports, for example, or virtual bands or maybe I mean everyone probably even though they are not the gamer they know Mario. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is a question for all of you. Sharing of data is, of course, one of the key issues here. Is the sharing of data, according to your mind, a sort of a black or white, open or closed matter? Or could the use of data, in your opinion, bring growth in particular to the creative sectors in Europe? Well, uh, I'd, I think it's uh, more of a, it's not a black and white yeah. area, obviously. I think, for again, for the, for the back office operate for the... Uh, administration, it is really, really important to, to yeah. share that data of ownership. Yeah. Um, but I do think that there is, there's clearly a, a, a value in that data, both if it's, uh, if it's who actually wrote, and wrote, on, wrote a song or played on a song. Um, there are, are user-generated uh, companies in in the uh, uh, digital sector that are, are uh, getting built and and that are monetizing these these things because we don't have our act together in in you know on the creative side yeah um, there's you know looking at Wikipedia which is clearly not a an authoritative as mm -hmm. I mentioned before uh, source there's uh, in the same way as you have an IMDb for for uh, movies, mm -hmm. you should have an IMDb for music. And there is a, a, a company that is looking at that, JAXTA, which an Australian company, um, where they're you know seeing the value in in having that information and being able to yeah. search that information um, and having having a, a validated source but i think that it's important that creators themselves then and and the people who represent them uh, as pros and publishers should be able to share in yeah. that that dissemination yeah. of data i see you bill okay. of course <laughs> well i'll, I'll uh, make another i agree with that i'll make another point which is that <coughs> good data uh, enables new models for revenue for content yeah. Yeah. that you haven't yes. had before Exactly. And you, you can't get to the new models in, in most cases without the good data. And as an exa there are examples from music, but just to vary things a bit from music for a moment, I'll, I'll talk once again about the academic uh, sort of um, what, you, what we used to call publishing world. I'm not sure what we call it now. Uh, but there's, there are companies like, uh, there's a company called ProQuest, which licenses uh, published materials for educational purposes, such as in classroom use. And that company would not have a business if there were not some sort of repository of information about what the content is, who the rights holders are, who needs to get paid for what markets, et cetera, et cetera. And they had to build that database up by themselves, uh, lar largely, um, largely by themselves. There was no authoritative source to do that, but they built the database over time and they were able to develop a lot of legitimate business models for that type of content. Um, and thereby um, replace or, or eschew the copying machine in the back office used by the professor because they can't clear the rights, illegal, uh, unauthorized use. So this is an instance where the availability of decent data led to new opportunities through entrepreneurial activity. Yeah. Well, 
yeah, how far do you think that the policymakers should then go in requiring that the right hole information is is op- or should be open and actually see that there is a question exactly the same? Shouldn't there be EU rules ensuring free access to right hole information? What do you think, Gail? Well, I, re- I mean, just to, just to go back to the previous question a minute, I just wanted to say that I absolutely agree with 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 Bill that there's so many missed opportunities for business yeah. opportunities because of the non-use of data and the non-sharing of data. Which is not to say that all data has to be shared free or for any reason, mm. because you know data is very different. It's very nuanced according to what it is. Yeah, Sometimes it's the result of a lot of investment. Sometimes it's private, so I think there has to be a nuanced data regime. In terms of the the right holders, but I guess it's for the right of the right holders to know how much. Uh, I mean, I think there has to be transparency, but transparency has to be also has to be given, doesn't it? So I mean, you have to maybe you want to keep something secret <coughs> as well, I guess. No. No. But who yeah. should give that? The, I think that the question is. Uh, who, we, who, uh, yeah, yeah. We we think that we should should be in charge of that since it, it originates from the, the creator. Um, but there are PROs that think that 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 should originate from them. I think, and and uh, I I I would definitely value um, some sort of governance that would say that that it would be in my right to yeah. to uh, share that information so we we're, we're also concerned about these issues and um, i you know i absolutely agree with you the important thing is going to be empowering the rights holder not not empowering the the platform <laughs> who already has plenty of power by the way so um, and one of our actions um, to support reuse under the policy of dissemination of digitized cultural content is in the development of standardized rights statements, um, which aims to help by standardized labeling of the type of reuse that is allowed. Th- that would be a great move. And there are standards today that you could build on to make that happen. Mm-hmm. What I was going to say is, um, you know, there may be market-based solutions. If you look at, for example, the rise of a company called Cobalt, which is a music publisher nominally, um, they are now a top 10 publisher, maybe even number two, three. They're, they're one of the biggest music publishers. And one of the reasons why they got that way is because they're data savvy. People will sign on to them because they know that their data is going to be treated well, unlike mm with perhaps some other publishers. I think that um, to get back to Hélène's point, transparency in how you are dealing with, if if you're an organization that manages data like a collective management organization, transparency about how you're dealing with that data, I think may be more effective than just some blanket rules about free and open access because there are these black boxes that exist, and there are companies for whom the black boxes are advantageous to the detriment of the rights holders. And I think that, that would be a, a tighter nexus for regulation if you're going to look at some, some regulation area. Actually, to, to uh, address that too, I think what, one of the things that we see, certainly in the UK, is the, the, uh, um, so the major labels have major publishers, and the major publishers sit on the board of the PRO and have, have quite a lot of, of uh, power yeah. on those. those. They even have the power to, to, to vote in who's going to be on, on the board from the creatives, you know, from the creators um, sector. Um, so sometimes they, they, I think that is a, a conflict of interest that, that we see when, when it comes to um, how the proverbial kind of royalty pie from the digital services is divided um, in the sense of that the, the major publishers answer to the major labels and uh, the major labels uh, have get a larger slice of royalties uh, on the record side than they get on the publishing side. So so there, if there's some, some sort of regulation, but I can, and I can also see it's different in different countries, which also confuses um, the whole issue within the EU, even when it comes to licensing, uh, yeah. because the rights that you have in in Germany, um, or, or the PRO has in Germany, is not equal to the rights uh, when it comes to what they can share and not share if, if it's in um, the UK or, or another country that has different rules. Can, can yeah. I just ask you a question? What, what about when you're starting out as a, 
uh, as a rights holder. So you've written a piece of something. Are, are people so excited to publish that they don't think about the longer term consequences? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of the things I, I, I remember just recently. It just struck me. Oh, God, I was, you know, Sing, uh, singing on a record back, you know, when I was 20 years old, when I was in New York, and and I could I, I remember the name, and I looked it up on YouTube because whether you can find it anywhere else, you can always find mm. all music on YouTube, uh, which is another issue. But um, <laughs> then, <laughs> so there I found it, and that then I saw what the the credits were on it and I then looked it up and it was on Spotify but nowhere anywhere was my name mentioned even though I was the featured singer and and uh, co-writer and I but looking back when I was 20 years old I was just I, I got an upfront payment of probably like $500 or something and I thought great and I get to perform it and everything and then down the line it's on a streaming service yeah. and which didn't even yeah. exist when I was 20 and uh, and, and all of that information is like it's not captured at the beginning, then it's not captured at all. Yeah, uh, I think a, a, a more general point, which which relates to the the my data initiative, also <coughs> is, you know, if you're a musician, you're you're playing music, you're writing songs, you're playing guitar, piano, whatever it may be. That's your skill. You know, having to learn all this business about rights and royalties is not what you mm. probably got in got into the game for right. and you know by generality by but generalization learning about all your online data and how it's being used for whatever purposes that's very complex and difficult and it also changes over time and how you educate the public on that is an enormous difficult task which mm. which no one's really discussed so far I, i'd like to to recommend a book that that uh, people should uh, look at about this by an author named Jaron Lanier, and I'm trying to think of which of the of the title it is. It's either "You Are Not a Gadget" or or "Who Owns the Future." It's one, it's his second book, but it, the the book basically says everyone should take ownership of and get paid for your own personal data, whether it's your social media posts, your healthcare data. Um, and if you're a musician, your rights and royalty data, that should be your data to sell or, or give away or trade as you see fit. And it's, it's great to, to make statements like that, but how do you even educate people about what that means and how to go about doing it? I, I just, that to me is, it just seems so, so hard. I don't know how you go about solving that. But I think, you know, you, as a music creator, you don't need to know the entire infra, now, infrastructure of how your, your music is disseminated. We need to kind of just make the most basic things of, mm. of first of all, that you have to register it. And this is something yeah. that is, is a, a real kind of passion of mine in, this, in the sense of I talk to songwriters that are like, oh, it, it shouldn't take 10 minutes to register a song on, on the, you know, PRS uh, uh, registra registration, and I, I kind of look at them and say, okay, so you've been working on, on this music for six months, and then you don't want to spend 10 minutes to, to register it to, to make sure that, you know, not only you get paid correctly, but that, that uh, you get credited correctly. Yeah. Mm. I mean, even if you work at, at Tesco or, or a supermarket, you have to you know, make sure that you your timesheet is in yeah. that you work that day. Mm. So um, the infantilization of music creators really needs to stop with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good point. There's a certain amount of admin work in every every job. So, but now I think we need to go forward to the next part. Uh, which is what can be done to develop the copyright infrastructure. I would now like to ask the whole panel what would, in your way, be the best way to develop the copyright infrastructure in an EU level, and who should be responsible for taking measures? What roles should the parties take? For example, should the Commission take a more strategic role in developing this infrastructure, or how do you see? Well... Really, I think it's, again, for me to listen to the others here. But, yeah. I mean, the current situation is um, we need to understand where we are and what the main gaps are and what the existing initiatives are. So the Commission is planning to launch a study 
um, with an analysis and the map. And then on the basis of that, we will see what could be done, uh, what could be the role of the public sector in general, and the value added of the EU more specifically. Yeah. Um, and there is an important issue here to do with standards and interoperability. Um, the larger the territory to tackle these issues, the better. And we have, uh, at least in the EU, some experience of standard setting. But mm. again, I think it's a question of getting all our facts and having a proper consultation before we make any decisions, which yeah. you know, could have a drastic impact. Of course. There was actually, I think, a question about the standards, what went wrong. Can I ask this, or will it be a very, very long discussion <laughs> only on the standards? Why some standards <laughs> failed? <laughs> Do you have a short answer, Bill? Well, I, I'm not sure that was a question or, or, or a reiteration of what I said on the slide. You know, he, here's why some of them failed. Um, the, the tweet there says, I seem to remember that ACAT failed because Google refused to use it. Absolutely right. Whoever said that, I completely agree. That's an equity problem. There was nothing in it for Google to use that standard. So just, just to um, try to summarize what that was about, ACAP, uh, Automated Content Access Protocol, uh, if I got that correct, was an attempt at a standard mainly from news publishers to label content according to usage rules such as, um, you know, you can't reproduce this photograph for the first 24 hours or seven days or... Mm. Um, th things of that nature to give news organizations some runway before Google just reproduces a news story and everyone goes to Google instead of the you know Times of London or the Wall Street Journal or uh, Helsingin Sanomat or whatever it is. Uh, and basically, it was the news public you know the news publishers telling Google what they can and cannot index and put up on their search engine. Google, you know why would Google? What incentive would Google have to go along with that? Yeah. The answer is none, so they didn't, and that's an <laughs> yeah. equity problem. Well, I, or I guess because they, the Google realizes that the, the threat of getting sued, or even when they get sued, they, get, they, they pay such a fraction, because obviously it, it's about you know, what, what they're allowed to do or not allowed to do. That, you know. Well, so whether they're allowed to do something like uh, index an article under copyright law is not cut and dried. There have been long, drawn-out court battles over, over questions like that. And yes, if you're Google, you have the wherewithal to fight questions like that in court, which they have done. But um, it, it's, not, it's not so simple as to whether they have the right or not under law. So for example, as a counterexample, at least, and, and again, this is ge geographically specific, and I know most about the U.S., so I can have to talk about the U.S. There was a court case in the U.S. that said it's okay for Google to reproduce thumbnail size images of those photos without permission. Hmm. And that was a contested issue. It fell on, on the side of Google or other similar companies. They're allowed to do that. So the rules are, sometimes it's hard to tell. Yeah. I'm curious if there's any good ac good examples from the creative industry we're not we haven't mentioned already. For example, Helian, uh, uh, please could you tell us more about your experiences with uh, using the session and some other tools to manage metadata on works? Yeah. So the the idea behind session, formerly oddly, wa yeah. was to capture uh, the the metadata as early as possible in the studio. Yeah. And, and make it as easy as possible for music creators. So basically, um, I mean, most music creators don't know what an IPI is, yet if the, your IPI is not connected to, to uh, your work, you're not going to get paid. Yeah. So instead of remembering your IPI, which is basically like your national insurance number, um, but for music, um, you would uh, automate that and have that digitized. So you just register with a platform and you verify your IPI number, which is your your um, uh, uh, writer's number and your IPN number, which is your, your number as a performer, which yeah. is a separate right. Um, and after that, everything you work on, your, your IPI number will be uh, attached to that particular work. Yeah. And then for that to be be automatically um, then uh, distributed to your uh, to everyone's PRO because one of the problems right now is that all the different songwriters and their publisher register their work separately. So all you need is for 
um, if it's nine riders with uh, in the top mm -hmm. ten in the U.S. for one of those riders to to uh, not uh, you know tell their their publisher the correct split, yeah. which is very easy if you're nine people and uh, there might be you know five percent to that person, seven to the other, um, that there's going to be a conflict within the P the PRO, and then nobody gets paid, mm -hmm. and this happens all the time. And and one of the things that that we're uh, that that also on the Iris Academy side very keen to happen is that when there is a conflict that that should be flagged up right away. Yeah. But with oddly, obviously, we what we were trying to to uh, avoid that right from the start, so that that the information that was uh, collected in the studio would be sent out to all the the publishers and PROs that were connected to that work. Yeah. So everyone would have exactly the same information, the same I identifications and the same split. Yeah. I see now a question. Music licensing is too complicated. It would be nice to have one single digital gateway through which to find out how to license the music. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Mm. Bill, with regard to the historical dimension of de developing the copyright infrastructure uh, and that there have been numerous attempts in the previous years to build an authoritative da database on digital uh, on rights on the music field, what are the lessons that we could we could learn in this sort of a field? Why isn't there a general database? Well, we don't have another six hours. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and, I, and I certainly don't have the whole answer, but um, I think I touched on a couple things. The, um, I touched on the incentives issue. Yeah. There needs to be incentives to build something like that. And another issue that I didn't touch on is, the, um, is what we call the garbage in, garbage out problem, which is that there has to be, the data has to be created correctly and timely in the first place. Only then can you talk about what happens to the data after it gets created in a meaningful way. So I've been involved with a standards initiative uh, in music called the Open Music Initiative, which attempts to do some of this communication of rights and royalty information on a blockchain. Well, that's a great idea for, for a number of reasons, but uh, that presupposes that the data is there in the first place and it's accurate and it's complete and it's not in dispute and it's timely and so on. And I, I mean, I will say, just to avoid being a total pessimist about it, that the fact that there's so much money and talent and hype in blockchain will have some knock-on effects into adjacent areas, such as perhaps getting the data right in the first place. <laughs> um, it doesn't directly solve the problem. No. So... Uh, there's another question for Marco now, and I think this is the last one we have time for. Uh, <coughs> does Supercell license its gaming figures, and how do you keep track who has the license and who are using your IPR without rights? <laughs> it's a tricky question. <coughs> well, <laughs> we don't really license our IP that much. Yeah. Uh, we try to, I mean, unlike many other companies, we tried to keep the focus on the game development. Obviously there are or there would be opportunities in merchandising or, or film mm. or so forth. We haven't done that thus far. But yeah. I do have to say that in the gaming industry it's a sort of eternal topic of discussion where goes the line between other developers being inspired by your games yeah, or copying your <laughs> games. <laughs> Welcome to the music. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the music industry. Yep. Yeah. There also, there's a lot of more, more potential. And uh, I think this discussion could go on forever. And let's continue it during the next break. But for now, I would like to ta thank our wonderful speakers. And And our wonderful audience, thank you for being so active. You just witnessed new revenue streams from data and platform economy. Let's keep the good discussion going. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, everyone, shall we begin? Let's take a seat. So, welcome back. This is the second session on track two, and it's called um, Building Trust in the Data Economy, People, Skills and Society. And this session will focus on building trust, necessary competences and active citizenship in order to harness the full potential of the human-centric European data economy. So, competent people constitute Europe's most important resource and competitive asset. Success in a global operating environment depends on the ability of citizens and or organizations to produce, understand and make use of information. And competences and information literacy start to develop in early childhood and continue to deepen and broaden throughout life. As we learned in the morning from Rita Kampi, one in three internet users are children, so it's important to keep that in mind. Measures to strengthen competencies and capabilities concern the entire population. And the European population's high standard of basic skills and people's opportunities to develop their own competencies are prerequisites of success. So, we're going to introduce our first speaker, Mark Durando. So, Mark Durando is the executive director of the European Schoolnet. European Schoolnet is a network of 34 European ministries of education, and its mission is to support ministries of education, schools, teachers, and relevant education stakeholders in Europe in the transformation of education processes of the 21st century digitized societies. Very excited to have you here. Welcome, Mark Durando. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for uh, having invited me here. And uh, of course, we're working quite a lot with our ministries of education for uh, the last 20 years on uh, how to transform our education systems, how to integrate the impact of technology in the teaching and learning processes. And uh, it's not so easy when we discuss about developing and implementing curriculum reforms, uh, capacity building for teachers, and all these type of activities. So uh, I would like to today to, to organize a presentation on uh, some reality linked to some figures regarding the workforce, the digital skills element, and then move quickly on what should our education system do and finishing by some reflections on the important role of teachers around this. So looking at the, at the reality and the workforce trends, there are certainly four major issues which are interesting to, to look at. The first one is the employability issue. And there is a rapid change in the landscape of available professions. We now are facing with new jobs that were not existing previously. We see now appearing GDPR compliance officers, uh, data ethics officers responsible. And that's quite a huge responsibility for education systems to try to see how we can prepare our students to, to, to develop within this type of society where jobs are changing very rapidly. Second element is more linked to the education systems. And we all know that they prepare students to be ready for the world of today, but it will be outdated by the time they will graduate. The third element is concerned more with the shortage of talents, and we are facing in Europe a huge shortage of talent in the STEM area, on the science, technology, engineering, and maths. All countries are facing by the disinterest of young students to take up science studies and later on science jobs. And when we look at the digital skills element or the high CTI professionals, all the data economy specialists, that's only a subset of STEM. And we can't consider having very high ICT skilled people if they don't have a basic STEM literacy uh, given uh, at the level of the secondary school system. And finally, the organization work structures are, are changing. They are more reactive, more agile, and all the decision-making process are organized quite differently. So uh, the, this slide presents you a certain number of figures, and I will only develop around two major elements. We have to realize that 65% of students today will occupy jobs that don't yet exist. And we have a huge responsibility 
at the level of education systems. I'm not even speaking about higher education, but only secondary education, primary education. And, so. and uh, McKinsey report, which is quite recent, 2017, says that by 2030, we'll have around between, and that's quite interesting to see the difficulty to have appropriate figures, between 75 and 375 million workers which will need to switch occupational categories. And it does raise a major question on regarding the impact of technology on work organizations and the skills. So there has been a quite interesting book published by the Curriculum for uh, Redesigning, a curriculum uh, on artificial intelligence in education. And we know that with the arrival of artificial intelligence and other technologies, machines will be better than humans for a certain number of tasks. And that, we can't fight against that for repetitive and predictive tasks, for tasks that call upon much more computational power, tasks which classifies huge amount of data and inputs, and tasks which can make decisions based on concrete outputs. That we know. But what we know as well is that humans are better than machines for experiencing authentic emotions and building relationships. It has to be connected to what we call these famous social-emotional skills, which have to be now entered into the curriculum and which have to be taught. Formulating ex questions and explanations across scales and sources. Deciding how to use limited resources across dimensions strategically. Making products and results usable for humans and communicating about them and making decisions according to abstract values. So, the digital transition is there. And we all have to realize that 80% of technology, which will be used in 10 years' time, are not yet invented. But we know that they will have to be implemented by 80% of people already in activity which put a lot, of uh, a lot of importance on the lifelong learning processes. But we also know from the research that 50% of current jobs worldwide, around 30% in Europe, will disappear within 25 years. And out of these jobs, there will be 9 out of 10 jobs which will require digital skills. That's a situation we know. The second element from the research tell us from international studies, and I'm referring to the ICIL study, that 44% of the EU population, age 16 to 74, lack basic digital skills. It has been just confirmed by the last monitor report published by the Commission recently. And that, therefore, we should question whether we are going towards a new social divide. And it is essential that our education institutions prepare students and teachers for this transition. So the next question is, uh, what should our education systems do? And by 2030, knowing facts will have little value. And that's the famous element regarding how we build curriculum between knowledge on one side and competencies on the other side. And now education we we'll need to equip learners to think creatively, independently, rigorously, collaboratively, but more importantly, in full awareness of themselves and their social context. Also, we should question also the, what education should offer to our students. And education offered to our students should meet a certain number of criteria. And the first criteria is versatility. We should provide to our students access to a wide range, a wide range of subjects on which they can build a robust competence for facing life and work. We should also have our education being relevant for applicability and student motivation. And finally, it has to be transferable. So students should be able to make use of the knowledge outside of the context in which it was learned. That's quite important that we keep these three criteria in mind. 
and it has to be developed via certain number of elements. And that's linked to the curriculum balance which has to exist. For the time being, when we face a curriculum reform, we are faced with the importance to add a lot of topics to a particular discipline, while very few are removed. And we really have a responsibility to look at making a selected emphasis on essential areas of traditional knowledge, so that we can add also modern knowledge. And we see in our education systems in plenty of countries, there has been a lot of reforms for introducing coding as a new discipline or integrated in existing disciplines. And it, it has to be done for finding a right balance between what has to be kept as essential content, content versus what should be removed. There should also be a particular approach on interdisciplinarity using real world applications. If you look at the STEM studies, one, the research tell us that as soon as we develop contextualization of STEM teaching based on real industry application, the interest of teachers and the interest of students is growing in a significant way. So we have to, to build the foundation for all the future learning and it has to be done around two main major axes, knowledge and competencies. And if we look at the foundational knowledge, so what we know and understand, we must consider now that content must be reconsidered on the basis of society's new relationship with information. And access to information does not necessarily mean access to knowledge. And it's quite important, and there are a lot of debates for the time being between experts to say whether curriculum should go to what is called expert amateurism, which has as objective to provide robust and flexible understanding of the fundamentals, or whether we should go to more expertise within subjects, which is more providing technical in-depth knowledge within a particular discipline. But we need a solid foundation of knowledge on which to build when it comes time to learn more or from which to apply what was learned in a real life setting. In addition to that, evidence also suggests that individuals forget academic content at a rate of 50% every two years. It does question us on what is the content that is worth knowing and not just searching when it's needed or learning if one chooses to specialize. Moving on the competencies, we all know that we have to develop and to, to have more emphasis on how we teach these competencies within our education systems. And that's organized around skills that you all know and that is famous 21st century skills. I will come back to this a little bit later. Character on how we behave and engage in the world using our curiosity, courage, resilience, A6 leadership and meta-learning on how we reflect and adapt. And moving now, and one of the challenges, how can we continue providing access to foundational knowledge while also preparing our students to acquire all these important skills? And moving on this, we have these famous 21st century skills, which have been subject to a lot of research. It's called, on the, uh, it has been done by the Partnership for 21st, Cent 21st Century Learning, and it has been developed. And we have all these elements, collaboration, criti critical thinking, creativity, and I will not develop all of them. But the major challenge is how are we going to teach these skills in our schools, and, but also how are we going to assess the skills? And we saw within PISA that the experience done for looking at collaborative skills has been quite a challenge. If we, if we look at collaboration, we think it's easy to assess how collaboration takes place at the level of school or the level of student. So the first question is, do students work together? That's an easy question. But then we can question whether they work interdependently. We can question whether they share responsibility. We can also question whether they take substantive decisions. That all these elements which have to be part of the assessment process of this co collaboration skill, which is not easy. The second element 
is what we can call redefining failure. And our students need to know that it is only via wrong answers and mistakes that the learning process is taking place. And we have to change it. We have to change it because the culture of failure is not the positive one as the right one in quite a lot of our countries. And we have to prepare students to be more resilient and to be re resistant and solid vis-a-vis -vis the failure. We need to, to them to be reflective so that they can question themselves on their success and failure. And also at the level of our teachers, we need also to have teachers being risk taker. How many evaluation of teachers take into account the risk taking element in what the teachers is doing in our various education systems? And to complete, we should question what the classroom should really look like. And that's the famous three M's. With, first of all, it has to be meaningful, motivating, but also made for everyone. And that's part of one of the major challenge, which is the inclusion challenge. So what transformation should take place then at the level of the school? There are a lot of transformation uh, framework which exist. And uh, students should be engaged in deep learning. And that's where technology takes its importance. We had the famous debate for a long time whether there should be technology driven or pedagogy driven. But from now on, we know that if we get the pedagogy right and we incorporate technology accordingly, then learning will become deeper, easier, and more engaging. So there are a lot of issues we really have to question to have a classroom which inspire learning, to also take into account the in and out learning school, uh, learning processes. We know that more than 30% of the knowledge is acquired outside the school walls. And that's extremely important that we can take that into account. And it does lead us now to question how we could implement innovation within our daily practice at the level of the schools. And here we are facing two different complete situations. The adoption of innovation in daily practice, we have on one side the current practice of teachers in a daily life in plenty of schools in Europe. In the best cases, they have interactive PDF textbooks. They develop learning scenarios. They maybe create learning resources. Maybe they are part of collaborative projects. And that's quite the maximum they can do. On the other side, there is the promises of artificial intelligence, virtual reality, augmented reality, learning analytics, cloud computing. But how many schools are so well connected with this? And we are in still two separate worlds. And the major challenge we have is to close the gap between these two worlds and to develop a lot of innovations. And we have a lot of innovation. There are a lot of schools which are innovating at the level of the school actors, at the level of the pedagogical challenges, at the level of the technical challenges, and that's quite important for, for that. But the most important element is it has not to be done by the convinced people. And the major challenge we have in innovation is to reach the ones which are not yet convinced. And in addition to that, all projects and pilots who are running in Europe, we should not mainstream the results of the projects, but we should certainly mainstream the processes which have led to the results, which is quite important. I will finish very quickly now on the important role of teachers in that process. And in fact, there are only two problems in education. That's what do we teach and how do we teach it? It's quite simple. And teachers should become change drivers, innovators and researchers, orchestrators of the learning processes. They should also become now on data analyst experts when we look at the new assessment approaches and the promises linked to learning analytics. They should be collaborative with their peers, but more imp importantly, they should inspire their students. And, and efficient teachers in this 21st century should be a professional with a high judgment capacity in situation, what we call a reflective professional teacher, the one who questions about his practice. 
Uh, Linda Darling Hammond from the Stanford Graduate School has a wonderful formula for questioning the professional teacher. As the one who learns from teaching rather than one who has finished learning how to teach. And that's how all our teachers should reflect and should develop. It's very, very important. I would conclude now by one slide, which is a time frame regarding the challenge that all our schools have. If you take a teacher which is, who is 50 years old, this teacher has acquired knowledge 25 or 30 years ago. And he will have to transfer this to a student who will use it in 10 to 15 years. So it does mean that the communication period of the knowledge is around 40 years which means twice or even three times more than any period which measures the key transformation of our society. And from time to time we say our education systems are not reactive enough, but when we look backwards how the programs and curriculum of education systems were 10 years ago and how they have performed now and how they have improved, I think that we have to be very careful on how we criticize that. I will finish, ladies and gentlemen, by saying that in fact, we only have two major objectives in education. And the first one is to increase the desire to learn for our students. And the second one is certainly to rediscover the joy of teaching for our teachers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mark. Very informative. I have a couple of questions for you, actually. Um, so firstly, I think from a Finnish person's perspective, we have um, been very proud of our level of education, but of course, since the society changes, you know, what it needs, what we need to be at that higher level of education, uh, we need to do very different things than in the past. And we've been talking a lot about um, lifelong learning. So what's your thoughts on, on this kind of um, aspect of educating people later in life as well? Because work is changing more and more rapidly. One of the success of uh, the Finnish system, and we know that you have been overwhelmed by, by a lot of visits from other countries to understand why the Finnish education system is so good result. One of the major elements is that one of the few countries who is teaching to the teachers the research and where teachers have a research dimension within their curriculum. And also, um, the organization of the education systems is left to the municipalities, which, which enable also to have an ecosystem which is more reactive. Now, coming back to the importance of lifelong learning, we all know that we'll change our job for uh, within a normal life now five, six or seven times. So which means we, on one side, if you have the arrival of the, um, the, the development of technology on one side and the capacity to change of job is linked to the capacity of education systems to make us learn how to learn after having been graduated. And that's certainly one of the most important elements. And that's why access to information is not access to knowledge. But if we give the right foundational knowledge to our students and they are able to access to other type of training when they have been graduated, there are so many offers which exist on, on, on the market that they will certainly progress and have no problem at all to make lifelong learning a reality. Okay, so one more. I'm wondering if you have some thoughts particularly on the data economy. Like what more do we need to uh, reskill people to, to really uh, be ahead of time in that aspect? To ethics and data protection. Mm. And I really think that we should have in all our curriculum much more elements regarding data protection issues, regarding how we use data, ethics regarding how data are used as well, so that students can realize that uh, when they have to operate in this digital society, they know how it is organized. Mm. And that's certainly one element. That's not the technical dimension. That's all the social dimension linked to the data economy, which have to be certainly taken into account. All right, great points. Thank you very much, Mark. Welcome. All right. So our next speaker is Teemu Roos, Associate Professor of Computer Science at University of Helsinki. He is also the leader of the AI education program at the Finnish Center of AI, FC AI. 
and he's also the lead instructor of the Elements of AI online course, which has been recognized all over the world. Great to have you here. Welcome. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, um, I hope you are enjoying uh, the, the program as much as I am. Um, as, uh, as she said, I'm a, I'm a computer scientist. I'm actually an AI researcher. Uh, but uh, the reason why I'm here is not uh, uh, exactly that. I'm not going to talk about algorithms or advanced uh, computer science uh, theory. I've, uh, in fact, acquired recently uh, or, or some years ago uh, a keen interest in the societal implications of, uh, of artificial intelligence and other uh, transformational technologies, and um, that is the, the reason why I'm um, here now. So, um, in fact, I would like to uh, put forward AI as a political question uh, or a topic. Um, and this is what we are trying to tackle also at the FCAI uh, here in, in Finland and, uh, and globally. So the, uh, the motivation was really, um, so first of all, of course, I'd have to, I have to thank uh, Mr. Durando for uh, setting the, the scene uh, in terms of the educational challenges of the future. Um, from my own point of view and about AI in particular, uh, I would like to highlight a few other um, aspects. First of all, everybody has heard about AI. It's really hard to not hear about it every day. We, we see it in the, in the news, in the newspapers, or elsewhere in the media. Uh, but there's a lot uh, to be said about the accuracy of the reporting around AI. And there's a lot of myths, and in fact, most people have at least some level of fear or um, worry concerning how AI is changing and transforming the society. And that has multiple consequences. Um, I will list just a few of them, um, f starting from the everyday cost of people not uh, adopting those solutions in their everyday life and not being able to enjoy the benefits of them, uh, to the scientific cost uh, where our societies are not motivated to invest our, our resources into the research that goes into this. And this is, of course, critical uh, as a question of different regions competing for the key expertise and, and, and the skills. Um, as a consequence of, no, uh, of lacking um, uh, academic uh, resources to invest in, in the research in this area, of course, we will be lacking or we would be lagging behind in the industrial innovation related to AI. Uh, but even these, I would say, are um, of secondary nature to the uh, to an, another worry that I have, that we have um, in in this case, and this is the what I call the societal cost, and this is what uh, I think in uh, today we are uh, well equipped to to discuss. Um, what I mean by that is that when the everyday people, the people that are the majority, not the experts, not the select few who are building these systems. Uh, when they are ignorant about what AI really is, what is the te technology behind it, it prevents them from taking part in the, in the public discourse and, it, and therefore in the political decision making that, that takes place. And that leads to the regulation of, this, of these technologies. And therefore, this is the argument that I have for saying that AI and realizing the, the opportunities through AI is not a technical question where we don't really lack those technical tools to, cre to, to reach uh, all, the, all its potential today. Uh, it's more a political question. So it's a question of keeping the uh, regulation up to date, keeping everybody um, on course for the, uh, for the, for the applications towards societal good. So what we need to solve these challenges is, uh, of course, better education, better awareness. We need experts reaching out. We need journalists uh, helping us convey the, the truthful messages to the audiences. We need everybody uh, being able to be more critical about what they hear about uh, these technologies. And above all, we need education. That, was, that has been the, the topic of this session, and I, that I think is, is the high, sort of the highlight and the, and the most important point. Uh, and we need that on all levels for kids, for students, uh, for people in the working life, so continuous learning and, um, and lifelong learning as well. What we have done 
uh, on this uh, front uh, is to create uh, the already mentioned uh, Elements of AI course, which is a, a free course for everyone, doesn't require any coding or math, math skills, and, uh, and it has become very popular uh, already um, now, and we'd like to make it even more popular in the future. Uh, also, this uh, I'd like to mention is a nice example of public-private collaboration between an academic institution, the University of Helsinki, and a private company, Reactor, which uh, have their headquarters in Helsinki as well. Uh, and the course, the, what, what the course is about, uh, is really not, again, the technical skills. It doesn't prepare anyone to become an AI developer. It's more for citizenship skills, people being able to be critical what they see in the media, what, uh, what they talk about, and uh, therefore take part in the, in the democratic decision making. And um, we've just, um, uh, we started in Finland uh, here in uh, 2018, and before long we achieved 1% of the population signing up on the course, and now we, we chose as our goal the ambitious goal of getting 1% of the global population, which is quite a few people. Um, what we've been especially happy about is the fact that uh, we have a very diverse user base. We've got users from 110 com countries and more, and we've got about 40% female. In fact, in Finland, the users are 57% uh, female. So this is not very typical in a technology uh, field. Um, and we've got also people already past their working uh, life. I think the oldest have been way over 80 years of age, and they've been very happy, happily completing the course. Um, so I'd really uh, like to welcome everyone uh, to, to take a look at the course. It's uh, easy to find. If you just Google for Elements of AI, you'll find that. Uh, and at this point, I would like to give the floor to one of our, our learners, and we'll be able to do that by a video insert here. Artificial intelligence is like electricity. It will shape our world in ways we cannot imagine. Its masters will control how we live. AI is power. In Finland, we believe it belongs to everyone. With the help of the University of Helsinki, we build a free online course called Elements of AI. It combines our national strengths, an exceptional education system and leading technological capabilities to give anyone, anywhere, the tools needed to understand AI. And it's taken our country by storm. Launched just last year, more than 130,000 people have signed up for the course globally, including over 1% of the entire population of Finland. Most importantly, elements of AI has cut across gender, age and socio-economic lines. More than 40% of sign-ups have come from women, while 25% of all users have been over the age of 45. Tämä tekoäly niin se ei ole mikään tulevaisuuden hirviö, vaan se on ihan arkipäiväinen asia ja se on ihan hauska asia. Kyllä mä suosittelisin tätä kurssia kaikille, jotka haluaa niin kuin pysyä ajan tasalla, ettei edes katso, että mitä se on, iästä riippumatta. Now Elements of AI is going global. The president of Finland has urged everyone to take it. We challenged the Swedish government to adopt the course, and other nations have followed its lead. With participants from over 110 countries, Elements of AI is already a worldwide success. AI is a human right. We are changing the way the world learns, and we want you to join the movement. There we are, so thank you very much. It's very important work that you're doing. So as you mentioned, in Finland, the goal has been to educate 1% of the population through the elements of AI. And the goal was met in just a couple of months in terms of registered users to the course. So what do you consider to be the most vital takeaways from the work that you have done in terms of scaling the development to the European level, level or even the world, since you mentioned that that's your, that's your goal? Would we need maybe a, um, ways to learn in a quicker way or, or what do you think? 
Um, yeah, so thanks very much. That's, that's a good question. Uh, certainly we think that it's not only a Finnish initiative, it's, it's a global initiative and we need to partner with, uh, with global and European partners to do that and we've already done that in Sweden and uh, since last week in Estonia and we are rolling out international partnerships um, almost every week it, it seems now and we're really working towards a European-wide uh, partnership to, to make it happen and it's, it's a question of offering people um, not only the online content but something more because we know that online content isn't always enough especially for people who are not uh, highly educated or, or university with university degrees, so that's that's one thing. Um, people of, often ask, like you asked, like I is there something uh, easier still than maybe taking this uh, a complete course? Um, we estimate that it takes about 30 hours uh, for most people, at most, to take the course. And if you think uh, in context like this, I often get asked from, let's say, politicians who are extremely busy. Uh, and they ask, look, wouldn't the, there be like uh, maybe half an hour <laughs> crash course, a really like summary of, of what, what we could learn? And uh, my answer is that if, how many of you have, for instance, read uh, Yuval Harari's uh, Sapiens, the short history of the human kind? Okay. And how many have read even two books by Harari? Maybe there's not. Okay. So again. So it takes about 15 hours. If you read, if you listen to the audio book, it's 15 hours. So if you've got two of those audio books, it's the same as, as, as this course. So I, I really wonder how many politicians uh, would say that they don't even read that much uh, in, in some popular science uh, category. And I think that, it, it, I think given the magnitude of the issue, and the importance of, uh, of, the, of this technology in our society, I think everybody in a position uh, to make important decisions should be able to invest that much of, uh, amount of time in learning at least the basics. Mm, exactly. And as, as you mentioned before, um, you can also do it while you're going to work, for example. So you're not using yep. time that you're taking away from your actual work, but time that is otherwise maybe not used in a uh, productive way. Precisely, yeah. Many users uh, uh, actually thank uh, especially the design of the course in the sense that it supports learning in small bits and piecemeal fashion so uh, that they can do it, for instance, during their commute. Mm. So, so that's perfectly feasible and, and possible. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Teemu. Thanks very much. Very good work. Thank you. <laughs> so... Next, we are taking a closer look into building trust through active citizenship. The development of trust-based society, building on data, is founded on people's sense of inclusion. In an increasingly digital society, social inclusion, accessible digital operating environments, and the opportunities that these create constitute one of the conditions of human well-being. Our next speaker is Turia Melani who is the deputy mayor of the city of Amsterdam. We're very delighted to have her here. As a deputy mayor, she is responsible for arts and culture and digital society. One of the key programs she is focusing on is a free, inclusive and creative digital city. As such, Amsterdam is one of the founders of the International Coalition of Digital Rights. Please welcome Turia Melani. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Can I have a hand? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so, good afternoon. I have to start with a confession, because I'm not a digital expert. So, um, I'm hoping I'm not disappointing a few of you, uh, because I will speak not as a dis dis digital expert, but just as an Amsterdammer. And I speak as an Amsterdammer because I'm representing cities and also representing the people who are living in our cities. The people that actually experience the impact of the data economy on their daily lives. And of course because I love Amsterdam. And I love Amsterdam because of this open vibe, the action, the diversity, the imperfections, the contrasts, the weirdness, 
and a beautiful chaos. But Amsterdam is changing, like many other cities. Our co core values, freedom and inclusion, are, 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 are at risk because of growing inequalities, because of segregation, and to a certain extent because of the data economy. I can give you examples of all of this, but you know all of this, and we all agree. We agree on the need for freedom and the need for inclusion. We agree on our responsibility to act accordingly and the need to regulate, but it is not easy to act on behalf of the people who are not here. So let's look around for a moment and think about the people who are not here. So the 38% of the global citizens without online access and the 36 living in extreme poverty. Not here are the people in Amsterdam who drive Ubers instead of ordering them who are losing business instead of ordering things online, who can't afford to rent a house instead of renting it out on Airbnb. And not here is my mother, because I'm working and I cannot take her with me all the time. So my mother can't read or write. She's so the introduction of the iPhone in 2008 and WhatsApp in 2010 have been a blessing for her, but also for me, because she lives very far from me, like 180 kilometers. We now communicate through WhatsApp video and audio. She connects our, her whole family also with WhatsApp. And I'm enjoying this tremendously. I enjoy the not very selfies, Insta Instagram kind of selfies she makes and the emojis she uses, but a little bit differently than I would should do it, but I think, um, and the pictures, of course, a lot of flowers. She likes, she likes a lot of the flowers she sends. Um, but she uses this new technology, uh, this language, and she speaks her own language, Arabic, fluently in her own way. And I would never, never take this new connection from her. But it's one thing. The information she sends and shares makes her vulnerable. And because she's not able to read and to write, she's less aware of the terms and the conditions and has less of a choice to opt out when paying for services without, with private data. And if we're honest, my mother is not so different from all of us. Nobody here reads their contracts or updates before clicking the yes button. We are all controlled by algorithms, all addicted to our touch screens, even now. Who of you have checked your social media instead of talking to your neighbors during this conference? I did, I have. But there is a difference between us and the people not in this room. We are seduced to buy a dress we don't need or to spend more time online. But the people who are not in this room are seduced to buy things they cannot afford to drive an Uber instead of getting an education, to share data that might harm them. But the biggest threat to our city is not a digital transition in itself. The biggest threat to our city and every other city there is the separation this data economy creates. The fact that most time spent online is time spent alone, not interacting with the people that co-inhabit your city. So the separation of the people in, the room, in this room and the people not here, that separation 
hits vulnerable people harder than us here? Are we making sure that a digital transition benefits those who need it most? You all know at least one of the vulnerable people I speak of. Think of that person. Is it the person cleaning your office? The one driving your Uber? Or your mother? Like mine. Think of that person. And ask yourself, is my organization, my next policy, benefiting them? Because it can. And it does not have to keep us from making money or growing the economy. I do not believe we entered an era without privacy or a winner-takes-it-all market because I don't do doom scenarios. But I'm here to sound a warning call. The people in our city, in our cities maybe, are losing trust. They are all losing trust in the data economy. They fear AI taking over their jobs. They are losing trust in us as politicians, as policy makers, as society shapers. We need, we need to make sure that the data economy benefits our citizens, all of them. As a city, we try and take our responsibility. In Amsterdam, we create open source algorithms that don't discriminate based on race. And we demand the same from our suppliers. We are collaborating with the city of Helsinki to create a standard for fair algorithms. And we have worked together, we're going to have much work together, much more. And that is why I have taken the initiative to start the city's coalition for digital rights. So now we have like 45 cities and 200 million persons strong aiming to protect human rights in digital area, era. We simulate programs that can open doors for people to make technology more inclusive. Uber drivers, like the one I've mentioned before, get the chance to learn the code completely free of charge. And if you respect digital rights, data sharing can be an asset to society too. As I've heard from Timu and my data of today, if hospitals share data with researchers and companies, it can save lives. So we support initiatives like the Amsterdam Data Exchange that aim to create a fair data marketplace. Last week, we hosted a meeting in Amsterdam of data exchanges organized by the European Commission. And we have learned from companies like Dewex that digital rights can be a competitive asset in the global market. We need Europe to make sure that the citizens in our cities can enjoy the same liberties online as they do offline and ensure that it serves everyone. And this is where you're coming. We need to create alternatives for tech monopolies. And we have some influence here. The city of Amsterdam has a budget of 7 billion annually. Imagine we, we pool just a part of this budget of city like Amsterdam and only spend this money on digital products that respect human rights. And imagine we all start doing this. We cannot create a fair digital marketplace on our own. We need to do this together. We need a digital new deal. A digital new deal that holds platforms accountable for their actions. The same we do for all other companies. A deal that stops online tracking and enforces privacy laws. A deal that supports alternatives to data monopolies. But most importantly, a digital new deal that will restore human dignity to make sure everyone in 
and outside this room can make their own choices. A deal that ensures my mother is safe and there are millions of people like my mother in Europe. Millions of people using digital options like us, but unlike us are completely unaware that these digital op options are using them as well. I want a digital system that gives my mother and the millions like her alternatives and freedom. We need a deal providing all these people and our daughters security. So it's like I told you, I'm not a digital expert, but most of you are. We need experts like you, startups, big companies, policymakers, academics. So please, the people who are here involved with the e-privacy reform Get back to the table. Stop online tracking and make a real change. But we also need people like my mother, not only by thinking of them, but also by including them, designing technologies and regulations. Make sure that a data economy is democratic. So in the room of experts, of people in suits, of people like you and me, not in suits, I ask, when you all agree with me, and I know you do, when you know the people I talked about like I know you do, what should this digital new deal look like? What can you do to differently to, to make it happen? We all have responsibility to make it happen, to make and help everyone enjoy this new digital world, to make some money, no problem there, and to put those who need it most first. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful speech. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so cities are playing an important role in providing services for the citizens and in creating conditions for well-being of their citizens sure. and residents. You spoke about people in Amsterdam being vulnerable in the data economy. How big is this group of people in Amsterdam? Well, Amsterdam is, is, is getting bigger. Mm -hmm. So for the next year, it's going to be like 900,000. But now we are like 850,000 people living in Amsterdam. So you can think about 800,000 people who don't really know how data works. And uh, I think um, if you really talk about vulnerable people, uh, it's like 150,000. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. But we should talk about everyone because everyone, sister, brother, mother, grandmother, I think a lot of people don't know how it works. It's not only vulnerable people, for everyone's mother. Mm. So that's a lot. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. We're all connected. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> right, so the final speaker of this track two will be Susanna Laurin, who is the Chief Research and Innovation Officer at Funka. Funka is an European European-based consultancy focusing on accessibility and usability. She's uh, leading strategic assignments on behalf of the European Commission and several national governments, as well as Funka's research and innovation department. She's the vice chair of the International Association of Accessibility Professionals and an expert and advisor for several national and EU level standardization bodies. So please welcome Susanna Lauren. Thank you. <coughs> so, how um, can I make this up? Yes. Um, <coughs> so, thank you for having me here uh, today. I think I sound worse than I when I when I feel. I I didn't drink whiskey the whole day yesterday. I'm sorry. <coughs> that would have been more nice. Uh, but <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk about uh, return on inclusion, uh, which is sort of similar to the former speaker, but with a, a uh, slightly different angle from, from persons with disabilities, but also a 
slightly broader perspective. So just a couple of words about the organization I come from. Funke, we are a small consultancy. We were founded by the disability organizations in Sweden uh, more than 20 years ago. So we were one of the first ones that realizing that internet won't go away. We need to do something for persons with disabilities as, as well. We have been pioneering uh, this accessibility uh, part um, <coughs> our work. We turned out to be a, a private company in the year 2000, and since then we are consulting in accessibility, uh, development, design. We do uh, full-scale uh, projects on, on uh, ICT development that are uh, guaranteed to be accessible for, to everyone. But we also do a lot of research and innovation on the European level and also for the World Bank and, and uh, national institutions. So we try to be in the forefront of everything we do. And we pride ourselves with saying that we, everything we recommend should be tested in real life with real people. Um, we do a lot of policy and in investigation studies also, mainly for the European Commission, but also for national governments. And of course, we also do a lot of standardization because the standard is really important to be able to have sort of a common uh, understanding of what, what the accessibility needs are. We're also one of the proud founders of the International Association of Accessibility Professionals, IAAP, who now have uh, members in over 60 countries worldwide, uh, trying to raise the level of, of competence among people calling themselves accessibility experts, uh, because now there's very few universities where you can study web accessibility, but now at least we have a couple of thousand people who are certified uh, accessibility professionals, which is a good start. More of them will be needed, as we have heard before. So you all know this, but we have a lot of technology around us. Even when we sleep, <laughs> we, are, we are measuring uh, everything on our bodies, and we, we, we use technology for everything today. Uh, of course, that is no, doesn't have to be uh, positive or negative, but that's just a fact. So uh, I'm just thinking every time something new is developed, a new app or a new website, please ask yourself, do we need another one? <laughs> or could we use something that's already out there or just refine it? But really... Uh, public sector services in digitalization societies are competing with a lot of well-designed and really motivating apps and services out there where that is maybe uh, fooling us to shop when we, when we shouldn't, but, but also they are sort of attractive to us. And really what we see from public sector uh, digital services is that they are, generally speaking, a little bit less attractive maybe. So with an increasing number of always evolving digital services, the sheer amount of interfaces, passwords and navigations are getting really difficult for more of us. I mean, I am not super old yet, but I still feel every time the ICT department say I need a new phone, I go, no, oh, I need to install it again and all my contacts will be blah. I mean, just a couple of years ago, I thought, wow, I get a new phone. That's really exciting. But something happens after a while, you get tired of this. And think about all the people who are not tech savvy, who are not interested in technology or have maybe a disability that makes this step even harder every time. Just every update is a hassle for some people. So we used to say that we have around 7.3 billion reasons for diversity, and that means also in the digital interfaces we do. We need to create diversity for groups like disabled persons, elderly, and individuals with another maternal language. These challenges of digitalization can be overwhelming, difficult, or sometimes absolutely impossible to overcome. Um, the principle of design for all uh, doesn't only have to do with or universal design, or um, you can call it many different uh, things, but really the concept of designing for, for everyone uh, sounds like an sort of a utopia or something. But the idea is that, that disabilities can be permanent, temporary, or situational, and some are very clearly visible and some are not. I mean, if you see a person in a wheelchair or a person with a white cane, then probably you understand that this person has a disability. But as a matter of fact, most disabilities are not. Uh, that visual. I mean, I, you probably don't see, you don't have I, no idea how bad my eyesight actually is because I've learned how to go about in a, in a room and people don't realize that I'm really visually impaired. But if you try to do something in the back of the room, I have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> so, and also an, a lot of other hidden disabilities like neurodiversities, uh, cognitive disabilities, ADHD, autism, all of this. You, we simply don't know. And hearing impairments are also usually uh, quite hidden. So, and there, of course, the socioeconomic um, reasons, lack of connectivity. I mean, there, there are many different 
reasons why people are not connected to the internet or not sort of following the dig digital path these days. And I mean, now we even see that some young people sort of stop doing social media because they are fed up or, you know, we see also negative uh, aspects of this. So if you count all these together, I mean, uh, we also, also used to say that, that uh, the disability community is the only minority that you can join in an instant. Everyone can join this, because if we fall down for <laughs> of this stage, then we can have an accident and so on. So according to the World Health Organization, around 15% on average uh, around the globe, uh, a human has some kind of disabilities. And then uh, if you put just the elderly, and that's the same, I mean, it goes from 15 to 20% in different parts of the world, but in, in Europe, we usually say 15%. Then 19% of the population are elderly, whatever that means these days, but, but over 65. And just under half of all Europeans, 46%, are not able to, to speak any foreign language well enough to hold a conversation. So 15 plus 19 plus 46, mm, 80% roughly, of the population are not your average 25-year-old uh, polytechnical university study student who, you know, tr tricks around with, with his, his iPhone and, and so on. We are we're just, we are struggling. Most of us are struggling to keep up uh, with digitalization. And really, persons with disabilities have fantastic opportunities, but also, if we don't do this the right way, if we don't create accessible services, then these people will be left out. Uh, there are many different uh, good ideas. This is a, uh, an example of, of assistive technology because there are plenty of support for persons with disabilities. This is, for example, an eye uh, device that, that gives input with the eyes. If you are totally lame, uh, you can, if you only have the, the motion left in your eyes, you can, you can use the eyesight to, to navigate your computer and also write books. We all know a, a great scientist uh, who passed away recently who did that. Uh, there's also a way to get output, even if you can't see. For example, blind users can use braille displays and screen readers to actually navigate and also get the content from, from all digital um, uh, surfaces or sources uh, written out, uh, read out loud, or you can feel it in, in the braille display. Also, for persons with cognitive disabilities or speech impairments, there are ways of doing using icons and si symbols to, to communicate uh, in, in different ways. Of course, we all know that computers will take over our lives when we, if we get old enough. <laughs> and also, there are now much more easy technology just to do captioning of videos and so on. It, it's not no longer difficult and, and cumbersome and, and resource demanding. You can really make sure that everyone has the possibility to to reach out and understand, get the information and also use the services independently because that is what the digitalization is making uh, possible for, for persons with disabilities. But all of you who are now digitalizing your services, you need to do it the right way. You need to follow the technical standards to make sure that your interfaces are accessible because otherwise these assistive technologies do not work and most of the websites and apps and services around out there right now are not accessible. So we have three uh, legislations coming already almost in parallel here in the EU after many years of discussions and, and, and um, negotiations. So in 2017, we got the procurement directive where there is a new paragraph uh, or rewritten paragraph on accessibility requirements. So now all public sector bodies that uh, uh, procure something over the thre threshold should um, uh, take accessibility requirements into account. And this is really changing the, the market completely. We see a, an enormous increase in ICT suppliers. All the vendors, they didn't all of a sudden wake up in the morning and say, hey, we like people with disabilities. No, no, no. They started doing this because of the procurement directive. So the regulations sharpened. Then in 2018, we got the Web Accessibility Directive. And this is a really strong enforcement in, in legislation. We went sort of from recommendations to, to really uh, to legal requirements, so all public sector bodies and also companies that perform public services uh, that are uh, managed or financed more than 50% from taxpayers' money need to um, make sure that their websites and documents and apps, also intranets and externets, are accessible. There's a timeline there, so we started, we had the first cut-off dates this uh, September this year, and then September next year will be the next cut-off date and, and so on. So they have a little bit of grace periods to do this, but really all public sector needs to um, adhere to these uh, requirements. And then in April uh, of this year, the European Accessibility Act was adopted. 
And that means that certain products and services, also in the private sector in Europe, will have to comply with the accessibility regulations. And the grace period is in until 2025, so it still takes some time, but that is just to make sure that the industry have the time to do this, this change. But the standards are there already, the people are there already, there's no reason to wait. Uh, we need to make sure that whatever we produce is accessible to everyone. And still, uh, we have this fantastic technology, we have the knowledge, we have the standards, we have the also the legal framework, but still, uh, most of the services we see, uh, especially from public sector, because that's where we do most of our, our research, uh, is not really reaching everyone. Uh, it's like that 80-20 kind of... Um, uh, balance, and that means that 20% um, of the users needs special handling in one way or another, and that is really, really inefficient. That is resource demanding, and it's also discrimi discriminating or at least stigmatizing to people that needs to have go another path. So we need to make sure that everyone can use the, the services that we provide to the citizens, because otherwise, well, we lose taxpayers' money, and we also, um, uh, I mean, it's just. The online services and digitalization will never be successful if 15, 20, 25 percent of the population is left behind. And manual handling can never be a, a good alternative. It comes at a cost, at least. Another perspective that is sometimes forgotten is really the motivation. So what's in it for me? Sometimes when we get in doing research for uh, public authorities that say, why, why isn't this uh, service successful? We made this fantastic app and nobody's using it. Well, surprise, nobody wanted it. <laughs> so motivation is always or sometimes forgotten when digitalization is, is happening. We are digitalizing because it's good for us uh, in the office or it's, uh, you know, we're saving money. It's much more practical if we do it this way. But really, it needs to be based on, on real user needs. Otherwise, it won't be successful. What is the point of having this service if people don't use it and then you need to ask yourself what's the motivation factor uh, before uh, for them to do it and we often see that when a digital service is not used it's just because either people don't understand what to use it for or they just think it's too cumbersome so my advice will always be to learn from, from the people who do things in a good way. So learn from success and there we can see, we can clearly see that when digitalization is successful in different parts of the world or different sectors or different, you know, can be cut in different ways. But really it's based on real user needs. It's never just the organization looking inward saying this would be good for us, the internal perspective. That just doesn't make it. You need to base all the digital transformation on real user needs. Also, uh, to be the EN standard, the EN301549, that's the European standard for accessibility requirements for digital, I, for all IT, uh, really all ICT. So not only the web and apps, but also like elevators and, you know, Internet of Things. So uh, another success fac factor is, of course, to be EN301549 compliant, because then you know that your service is possible to use for, for all users, even with or without a disability. Um, and as important as uh, following the standard is, of course, to make all the production or produce the procedure of all of this an it iterative process, including user testing or focus groups or interviews or some, sign some kind of it iteration, at least, with the users, so that it's not a just a technical exercise internally. Um, also, we see that often uh, there's a lack of transparency. That differs really a lot between uh, different uh, European countries, but <coughs> But when we can have a transparent uh, feedback mechanism, for example, or that people can really s ask questions and, and you, know, you can see how my, my errand is handled during the, the process and so on, that builds trust and with trust, users come to your service and it will be much more in use. So really, trust through t transparency is also a very strong recommendation. And the last one, just be prepared the best way you can. You know, spread knowledge, make sure that, that you have this competence in-house, you don't get dependent on, on external consultants and, and so on, because really digitalization is a moving target. And we have heard today about AI and AR and VR, and I don't know how many uh, different kind of uh, abbreviations you can spread around like buzzwords, but really things are changing extremely fast and well, we can't do anything about it, or I c at least I can't, but we need to be prepared to change things quickly and maybe not invest too much in, in just one silo at a time, but really try to make sure that we build dynamic and flexible uh, interfaces and, and system, back office systems, so that we can uh, make use also of, of tomorrow's technology if possible. 
make robust uh, technology. I think that is the way to put it. And I just want to uh, end this quick speech with a quote from Steve Jobs, who I think says it in a good way, because people, the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. So, thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Very important points. So, um, I believe that digital support is important so that all people can be guaranteed the possibility to use digital services as well. And that's why many countries are developing digital support models to help people uh, access these digital services and show how these um, digital support systems uh, should be organized. Uh, what do you see is the most important in such models and pr in, in providing uh, digital support? Well, <coughs> I think digital support uh, is sometimes sort of training or, you know, it's like a one-off thing. You, you try to teach people one time or you do a, a project or something. I think it's the ongoing process that is most uh, helpful. Really have somebody to call when, when things break down. I mean, my mother sometimes calls me and said, internet broke down. And I'm so happy because I can fix the internet. It's kind of, <laughs> it's a wow th factor for me. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, well, well, I mean, it, it could be the modem, it could be the computer, it could be her software, it could, I mean, it could be anything. It's usually not the internet, but, you know, it could be the internet. And that is, that is the, the continuous support. I think that is the most important thing, to build services around um, online support or phone support or, or places you can walk into and, and get support or something like that. But the ongoing regular support, that is really what we see with, with many users that we meet, that just trying to, to get manuals or, or training and things, that's a good start. But really, it's, that it's when you get home with your device and it doesn't work. That, that is, and, and it's sort of 10 o'clock in the evening and you have nobody to, to turn to. That's when, when the digital support services is really needed most, I would say. Yeah, I agree. Continuity is important. And of yeah. course, they need to evolve in time when, yeah. when the support needs to evolve. Mm. All right. Thank you very much, yes, Susanna. Thank you. So... Uh, now we will have a short break and we'll continue the discussion on human-centric European data economy in the main hall next door. So we will continue at uh, 4.15, so very, very soon, and we'll end the day in that room. Thank you very much.